All right, welcome everyone. Um, I think we're just going to get started. I guess we'll leave the door open for a little while in case anyone new comes in. So thank you so much for coming. This is, uh, we're just going to run over um, a little bit of information about our firm, Bates White. We recruit a lot from Wellesley. I'm a Wellesley alum, and um, a lot of Wellesley alums end up at Bates White, and in my opinion and in my experience, do pretty well. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about our firm, and we're also going to walk you through what an economic consulting case interview looks like. Some of you might have done a management consulting case interview preparation. It's pretty different from that. So we'll go over what our interviews look like and give you all some tips for doing well. So before we get started, um, just a couple administrative things. We are not here to offer anybody a job. Uh, we only hire juniors and seniors, but we're hopeful that you'll Listen to us talk and like what you hear and come back and apply next year. And second, our firm doesn't sponsor um, visas for uh, non-U.S. citizens. And I don't know if our competitors do or not, but regardless, if either of those things make you not want to be here, you should feel free to go and there'll be no hard feelings. Um, but otherwise, we'll just proceed. All right. So first, some quick introduction. This is me. I'm Kelly Alexander. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of how fun I am. Um, I was a Wellesley College alum in 2016. I studied economics. Uh, I work in our litigation practice, um, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit later. At Bates White, I've been almost three years, which means I'm three years out of college, which is a freaky feeling. Um, my favorite Boston restaurant, this is a little bit of a joke, because of course, Juniper, for those of you who know, it's not in Boston, it's in Wellesley, but it's really good. I recommend it highly. I have a lamb bolognese. It's delicious. I had that last night. Delicious. It's still good, yeah. yeah. Um, and my favorite DC activity is running on the National Mall. Uh, I bring this up for women in particular because it's like really safe. It's the only place, I think the only big city in the world where you can like run at three o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. feel totally safe. Okay, I'm Brian. This is Luke. Uh, I went to Dickinson College, which is a tiny school in the middle of Pennsylvania most people haven't heard of. Uh, it's a liberal arts school. I got an econ degree. I learned nothing there that was relevant to our work, which is more quantitative focused. And so I took a, a quick vacation in 2006 to go to MIT and uh, get an MBA, and that is slightly more related to the type of work we do. Uh, I've been at Bates White for 19 years. I was the first undergrad they hired. It's the only job I've had as an adult. Um, my favorite restaurant is Cambridge Run. It's also not in Boston proper, but has anybody been there? Everybody always says they don't know what it is. Anyway, it's delicious pizza fries. Uh, and obviously we like hockey in my family and so I like to rub it in that the Caps beat the Bruins. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna talk about Bates White more holistically and then Kelly's gonna take over from me and we're gonna not do the typical switch back and forth because I find that awkward. Also, we don't tend to present to people like this, so if it's like, you guys are kind of awkward up here, it's because this is awkward for us too. Uh, some of our, Competitors will send up like their marketing or HR teams to talk to you and they're professionals and this is just a little bit different for us. So. All right, so about Bates White. Um, a few things you should know. None of these pictures are really relevant to you, uh, but that's Washington. And those are our food trucks where consultants go to eat primarily. And that is a fake picture of our building. So we just moved this year into a new building that's beautiful, it's all glass, but there's nowhere you can actually get that view of it. Uh, more importantly, uh, we're about 20 years old, so we've moved from the startup phase, which is what it was when I started, and that was super exciting because every time we had a meeting, if it went well, we got to keep working. If it went badly, we had to go find new jobs. <laughs> we are no longer doing that, uh, which I actually prefer. Some people, I think, miss the old days. They're more exciting, but I like the stability. So we're approximately 220 people. Um, we occupy sort of a niche in our industry. We'll talk about it a little more. Uh, economic consulting, uh, I forgot to ask. Do you, any of you actually know what economic consulting is? Be honest. Some subtle nods. Okay, we'll get into that. It's a small niche industry. Um, we have a few very large, relatively speaking, competitors that are public companies or parts of public companies with several hundred or even thousands of consultants. And then there are lots of uh, companies that do this that are like, 10, 20 people, or our professors with some RAs. It's somewhat unusual to have between 100 and 500 people in this industry. So we like that niche, we're privately held. 
uh, which means we can do things like invest in our um, office space and our people. Like one of the things everybody likes about our office is everybody gets a private office, so their own space, but then we also work primarily or a lot in war rooms. And we have no corner offices in our building. All the corner spaces with all the windows and everything are where the uh, consultant teams go and sit uh, to do the work. So I think in a public company you would not see things like that. Okay, so every consulting firm that comes and talks to you is gonna have a slide that looks just like this. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, um, but we're ranked by Vault. I assume everyone's heard of Vault. Uh, in a number of places, we'll talk about that more later. Something that is more recent is we're a top workplace in DC. So for the last several years, we've been anywhere from number one to number 10 on this uh, survey that goes out, we love that. Um, and I think that's all I'm gonna cover here. Okay, so what is economic consulting? So very briefly, uh, economic consulting is when companies are involved in a litigation, they have lawyers to deal with legal things and then they have economists to deal with number things. And that's where we come in. So uh, a couple of examples here, I'm gonna talk through maybe two of these, but to give you a sense, I'm gonna start at the bottom of the screen because I think that's easiest to get your head around. When two companies wanna merge, Generally, the government doesn't like that and tries to fight them. And so the companies uh, hire economists to say uh, things like, well, there will be efficiencies, we'll be able to drive down our costs and you know, save money, and we'll actually charge our consumers less. So everybody's gonna be better off by this merger. And the government tends to hire economists to say, you guys are gonna have too much power as a result of that merger, and you're gonna drive prices up and consumers are gonna be worse off. And then we have what's called a battle of, an ex of the experts, and so we fight about those things. So that's an example of what we do. All right, two cases that are near and dear to my heart. I also work in our litigation practice primarily on price fixing cases. So for those of you that don't know, price fixing is illegal in the US. And what that is, is when companies get together and say, hey, let's stop competing and raise our prices so we can all make more money, which seems like a logical thing to do, which is why the government says you're not allowed to do that. And then eventually you get caught and you face lots of litigation. And so a case that I worked on starting in 2006 and stopped working on start in 2014, these cases go on for a long time, was LCD panels. And I like it because it's the first case I worked on that anybody cared about, because um, people know what LCDs are. The other things I worked on before that were cardboard boxes, hydrogen peroxide, vitamins, chemicals that go into tires, and things like that. This was like our first high-tech case, and I loved it. Um, so anyway, what happened there was all panels that go into LCD products are made in Asia, in uh, Taiwan, Korea, China, Japan, by companies like LG, Samsung, Sony. And those companies got together and raised prices. And that means that companies like Motorola, HP, and Dell, and then Best Buy and you know, Costco paid too much for products that had LCD panels in it. And we got hired by a group of plaintiffs to figure out how much uh, they overpaid for their prices. And so we spent approximately $40 million of our clients' money to figure out what did prices look like in the real world and then what should they have actually looked like in the world without those bad acts. So that seems ridiculous. Basically, you've spent $40 million to come up with two lines. Mm -hmm. But that is the world we operate in. So that's the LCD's case. Um, LIBOR is my second favorite case because that one's also been in the news and it affects a lot of things. And it's an interesting uh, mix of our cartel's price fixing practice and our finance practice. And so the allegations in that case, which you may have read about or talked about in classes here, um, are that the 16 to 18 banks who set the LIBOR rate artificially lowered it um, to protect their reputations during the financial crisis. And so, they were saying, okay, do you guys know about LIBOR, what that is? Okay, LIBOR is an interest rate that isn't reflecting actual transactions. Companies, these banks just call up the British Bankers Association and say, I think if I wanted to go borrow $100 million, it would cost me 3%. And it's a signal of how strong they are as an institution. And the lower that rate is, the stronger they seem. And so during the financial crisis, they were all worried they were gonna go bankrupt and not be able to borrow any money from other people. And so they said, well, we're super strong, so we're gonna 
lower that rate to make it seem like we're even stronger than everybody else. And eventually they got caught and fined by every government in the whole world, basically. And now they're being sued by all the people who had financial instruments that were tied to LIBOR. So we, I've been working on that. So I'm gonna move on from there. But those are the types of cases we deal with. All right, so um, a precursor to this slide. I bet you can figure out what the next part of this is gonna be, its similarities and then differences. In no way is this meant to uh, say that what we do is better than other types of consulting. It's just trying to help you understand the differences between those two types of uh, consulting. So the similarities between economic consulting and all others that have consulting in it. Uh, you have highly educated staff. So we have about 180 people at our firm who bill the clients, we call it client services. And of that, somewhere on the order of 80 or 90 have advanced degrees. And of that, about two thirds are PhD economists. So there's a lot of people there with advanced degrees. And then we have about 100 people that uh, come from schools like Wellesley. Uh, and those are our consultant staff. Uh, that is not wildly dissimilar from what like a Bain BCG might have on staff. We do a lot of work in teams. I told you all of our corner spaces are where we put our teams to work. Um, there's very little uh, work by yourself in the sense that most of our cases have a senior person on the top who will be the expert and then there will be a couple project managers and several consultants and economists uh, all working together to try to figure out the answers to the problems. So it's very little like small teams, one-on-one -on -one kind of cases, so a lot of teamwork. Client services, um, that means you're not making a widget, you're selling yourself and your brain, basically. So that's the same across all consulting firms. Um, and I'll skip to the last one, impactful work. The cases we work on tend to move at least hundreds of millions of dollars and often billions of dollars. So we don't have uh, a lot of cases where there's not much money at stake. So just like a big company is not gonna hire Bain to do an analysis that's gonna move a $50,000 profit around, uh, companies aren't going to hire us to look into a litigation that's for $50,000. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so what are the differences? Uh, economic consulting is a very academic um, focused environment. And what I mean by that is the way the industry is set up is you have a PhD, generally a PhD economist on one side, who's fighting with an equally qualified PhD economist on the other side about economic concepts. And you're trying to convince your clients who are lawyers, judges and juries that you are correct. And so often what you'll see is the people who are experts in our field are actually professors and universities. So the people I work with primarily are the chair of the econ department at Stanford. These are all partners in our firm. Uh, the chair of econ at Penn State and um, a business school professor at Duke. And so those are the people who are actually going to court and testifying and they're having a bunch of teams uh, supporting them. So it's a very academic environment because you can imagine if somebody's the chair of econ at Stanford and they're being retained to talk about economic concepts, you don't want to show up with somebody like me without a PhD who's going to try to fight that person. That's just a natural disadvantage in front of the jury, so it tends to be very academic. Okay, the robust data analysis piece of this. The way this field works I think is very exciting, but it's also very stressful. And so what happens in a typical case is um, you have plaintiffs and defendants and there's a litigation. So everybody gets hired and then you go through this period of discovery where you turn over both sides, all the data and documents relevant to the case. And so um, the LCD's case I was talking about, I think we had something on the order of 20 million documents and several terabytes of data in different databases that formed all of the information available to us that we had to figure out how that all fit together and tell a story about why our uh, clients were harmed. So we prepare a report, it's called the expert report, and that's a summary of all of the opinions that our testifying expert's gonna have. And then that involves like simple things like just doing the data processing, summarizing the market, all the way through the PhD statistical modeling, econometric work that we do. We ship all that stuff over to the defendant economists including all the code that uh, we use to make our analysis. And they spend weeks, months, millions of dollars trying to figure out everything we did wrong 
and they write a report that says, okay, everything Bates White said was total nonsense. Mm -hmm. They make fundamental flaws, they have all these errors, they just don't have economics, and they write a whole report saying that, and this is the right way to look at the world. And then we write a report that says, everything they just said totally mischaracterizes what we said, and they're wrong for all the following reasons. Um, so I'm being a little glib, but that is in fact how it works. And so as you're preparing your report, you're super stressed about not only doing a good job for the sake of doing a good job, but because people just like you are gonna spend weeks and months figuring out all the mistakes that you had and then gonna write a report that your clients read and you're gonna to have to defend yourself. So you do robust work to try to make that as hard as possible on the other side. Um, that is different than most other types of consulting where the real battle is to get hired in the first place. And so once you get hired, you know, if you're doing a consulting project for a company like Motorola, Motorola is like puts a project out to bid, Bain, BCG, McKinsey are gonna to fight to try to get that work. But then once they have it, they're in Motorola, they're not gonna fight with the competitors trying to keep the work. It just doesn't work like that. Um, I'll skip some of these. Litigation environment, almost all the work we do is uh, involved with litigation. And that has certain implications for things we do. Number one, maybe most frustrating for our field is we have uh, the lawyers who retain us as clients they're retaining us on usually on behalf of corporations who are also our clients. And then um, all of our work is subject to the whims of the court. And so the judges can set the schedules, they can change the schedules, they can change the uh, things that you're allowed to present to a jury at any point during the uh, litigation. And that can be enormously frustrating, uh, but that's the litigation environment. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, and maybe, the best part from my perspective is limited travel. When I was your age, I used to think like the, the idea of traveling every week to a client site sounded really exciting and I would love to do that. And then I got a little bit older and I realized I have no interest in doing that. And um, economic consulting involves almost no travel. And in fact, for the last two years, I think the only travel I've done for work is for recruiting, which I opt into because I like to do it. And so you don't have to do that. In part, that's because um, all the lawyers are in DC for all intents and purposes. And most of our clients are interested in hearing from the lawyers as opposed to the economists. So we don't have to, the corporate clients, so we don't have to fly around and talk to them. Okay, so what sets Bates White apart? Again, um, some of this will probably look the same on any consulting firm who comes here. They're going to tell you all the great things about them. Um, I'll highlight a few um, that are particular to our industry, the first two here. So, um, when I started at the firm, uh, they told me, well, industry standard is two years and out, which means you come in as an undergrad, you work for two years, and then you go back to business school. And that was just universal. Everybody in the industry did that. And then I was there for two years, and I liked what I was doing, and a couple other people were in the same boat, and we said, hey, we're actually reasonably good at our jobs now. Are you sure you want to kick us out? Mm -hmm. And the bosses are like, no, I guess not. You can be senior consultants, but you can never be in management. And then the process repeated itself a couple years later. We're like, no, we're actually really good. Are you sure you want us to go? And they said, no. And so they got rid of the glass ceilings. And so what we found in our firm, we actually think is a competitive advantage, is uh, we have a career path for people with undergrad degrees all the way through partner. Um, so uh, we have actually, I think, three or four partners who started as consultants right out of school and have worked their way up through the chain. That's very unusual in this industry. Um, and I sort of touched on the second one. So it is still fairly typical in this field for people to work for two years and go back to primarily business school, although people also do econ PhD or law school. Um, we want people to stay at least three years. We think it takes at least a year to get, get to be like reasonably good at this job. And we really like the people who've been around three, four, or five years because they are very good. And so we try to encourage people to stay. So we um, have a number of policies in the firm uh, designed to do that. Like we have 401k match that vests in three years. We have the career path of revolving around three years, things like this. Um, next. Okay, a few more things. Um, actually, I'm gonna focus on these two this time. So things that I like about my firm, our firm, uh, is it's very open and uh, our founders are still heavily involved. We were founded by five people Three are still at the office every day. 
and the managing partner is not one of those people, but he's also in the office every day. And the way our firm works, the managing partner is like the most important person in the firm. He sets the direction of the firm, and in conjunction with the COO, they make everything happen. And so every quarter, those two people go to a meeting with just the non-management staff and present the same information that they give to the partners in their quarterly meetings. And they say like, here's how the firm's doing, here's how utilization's going, here's how profitable we've been this year. What are we worried about? What are we excited about? Things like that. And then the staff can ask any questions they want. I've never been there, but I hear it's it's very heated at times. Um, maybe Kelly can speak to that. Um, the other thing we emphasize is we have a 360 review process. And what that means is everybody is encouraged to give feedback on everybody else. And so if Kelly wanted to, when we get back to the office, she could submit feedback to my sponsor, my boss, and say, Brian did a terrible job or obviously an excellent job at the presentation for all the following reasons. And that is factored into the feedback that I get um, in a serious way. And so we respect the staff. We have this thing, I'm not sure if we talked about it in the presentation, we call it a quality work experience initiative, uh, which is really from the managing partner and COO saying, this is a stressful job. We care about the experience our staff has. We are holding you management accountable to a whole series of things about giving them a good experience. So that's one of the ways it manifests itself. So now that Brian has spoken a bit about the firm in general, I'm going to speak a little bit about the consultant experience. Um, I'm a consultant. I've been here, as I said, for about three, well, almost three years. Uh, the work that I've done on a daily basis is, I would say, like both qualitative and quantitative. It's super diverse. I work in a bunch of different industries with different people. Um, I want to highlight one or two things here because you guys can read yourselves. Um, in particular, this item, statistical modeling. Uh, I, when I came out of Wellesley, had really enjoyed my econ classes. I was really, had, I loved my professors, I thought the work was interesting. I didn't think that I was going to be doing that kind of work on a daily basis at my job. And I do, actually, not every day. A lot of days, sometimes I'm doing market research, I'm writing background on different industries, I'm helping people with reports. But other days, I am working directly with uh, people who are professors at different colleges, often really, really, really good colleges or former professors, um, doing things like IV regressions, fun, exciting statistical modeling. I was working recently with an MIT professor building this insane structural model of this industry that I, it was incredibly cool. So I think that that's something that's really exciting, but something that's sort of equally exciting to me is reviewing legal materials. It doesn't sound exciting when we put it up like that, but uh, when, as Brian said, we get all of this information from the other side, uh, a lot of what comes with it is what we call discoveries. So this is anything that might come up in a legal, in litigation, which is emails, things like this, to show that people have been doing something wrong. And so I spend a lot of time going through these materials and backing up our arguments. Um, but. I mean, this is exciting and interesting. It's like fun, qualitative work. Uh, also, it's sometimes really funny because you get to read people's emails, and in particular, people who are pretty high up at companies. I've read, I've read some funny emails in my time. Anyway, that's always fun. Um, the work I do is not only my direct client work with all this billable work. We also do a lot of non-billable work, and at Bates White, I find that a lot of value is placed on the non-billable work. What I'm doing right now is non-billable work. This is recruiting work. So um, I spend a lot of time uh, working, for example, I'm an Excel trainer, so I help people, uh, consultants coming in with uh, learning Excel. Um, we also have things like, for example, academic seminars. All of the PhDs who come in uh, to get jobs at Bates White have to do a presentation of their research. So what that means is that I often get to hear some of the most exciting, cutting edge new research. Um, and this is work that's not directly client work, so it's not work that is being built to clients. It's just work that uh, Bates White thinks is important. We often call it like firm building work. Um, which is My favorite thing about my job is the culture at the firm. So I think Brian has spoken a lot about how the firm works at an administrative level, but the consultant experience is really, really wonderful. I have people that I work with every day who are really close friends of mine, who I really like. These are not just my peers, these are also people I manage and people who manage me. Um, people at Bates White are 
super intellectual, they're academically oriented, they're fun, they're interesting, they're often very friendly. Our work is super cooperative, and so I think people like working together, and out of this sort of cooperative collegial spirit have come a lot of different initiatives. For example, we have a women's network. Um, that's exactly what it sounds like. It, it's um, a board at Bates White full of people like me who put together initiatives to uh, do education for women, little networking events for women in the firm, and so on. I also sit on the Diversity and Inclusion Council, so we uh, run events to promote diversity and inclusion at the firm. This includes educational events, this includes bringing in speakers, and um, often training people on diversity and inclusion. Uh, recruiting is always fun and exciting. It's fun to come meet people like you guys. Um, and we develop and teach classes. Uh, so as I said, I'm an Excel trainer, but there's also Stata trainers. We're working on an R training currently, and that's employee driven. So it's driven by people like me who have something that I feel would be really helpful and important for people to learn. And those initiatives came out of, like I said, consultants. It's also a pretty social firm. Uh, it's a little embarrassing to admit, like most of my friends are at work. Um, I didn't value that when I was uh, at college. I didn't think that coming out of college it was necessarily super important to work with people that you liked. I wish I had cared about that more. I got lucky. Um, I love the people I work with. They're fun. Um, I have a lot of really good friends at work. Uh, and Bates White spends a lot of time and money uh, building this environment and making us all sort of be friends with each other. So we have fun holiday uh, celebrations whenever there's a bunch of new hires that come in. We have a pizza and drinks reception to get a, let everyone get to know each other. You have to come up with a fun fact. Um, we have employee lunches with partners. So I was recently on a lunch with two different partners and then also people from all over the firm that I don't work with every day so that I can get to know them as well as the teams that I work with on a daily basis. So these are just some of the things the firm does. Uh, but there's also, of course, you know, a bunch of us hang out outside of work. But also, you don't have to. They always tell me to say this. I am a very social person. I like working, hanging out with my colleagues. You, you don't have to. But you can. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to walk through um, a sample case interview. So this is just a chance for you guys to see what our economic consulting interviews look like. I do a lot of these case interviews, I, uh, which means I give them to prospective candidates. I think they're kind of fun. Um, these are different from the management consulting interviews. I don't know if you guys have read like Case in Point or done any of those. This is a different structure. Um, and the case interview I'm going to present to you today is a very simplified version. So if you're looking at the case we're doing today, this is just to give you a sense of the structure and of what sorts of things uh, we look for and give you guys some tips to help you if you come and do a case interview. Uh, but if you're thinking to yourself, like, this seems incredibly easy. It's, it's, not, it's not that easy, but it's manageable. So please, this is meant to be sort of interactive, so I'm going to ask you a few questions and you can raise your hands or sort of just shout out the answer as we go through. So a case interview um, is meant to be sort of a discussion, a back and forth between the interviewers and the interviewee. Um, the goal in the case interview is to get a sense of how you think through economic consulting concepts. So. Throughout the case interview, the most important things are really uh, what your thinking process is like. So my biggest tip for everyone who's doing a case interview, this I probably applies to management consulting interviews, but in particular to economic consulting interviews, is to talk your interviewer through your thought process. So we care a lot about how you're coming to your answer, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but make sure to always state your assumptions and uh, explain to your interviewer why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so, for example, like long silences where you're sitting there thinking are not necessarily something that's helpful for the interviewer for assessing your thought process. Something better would be to think through, even if you're not sure what the answer is, to walk us through what you're thinking and just to write a bunch of things down. So, I'll touch more on that later, but the idea of this case interview is to show you a little bit about what our cases are like and the types of problems we solve. This case is going to focus on the competitive effects of a proposed merger. So I'll walk you guys through it. As I said, we're looking through these particular skills, um, basic economic concepts, understanding how you work through problem solving, and in particular, a sense of what it would be like to work with you. Um, often at Bitsport, we're not looking for people who are like 
super competitive. We work in a very collaborative environment, so uh, it's meant to be sort of a, a conversation between you and your peers. We are not looking for previous knowledge of the situation. I want to highlight this because when I was at Wellesley, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about mergers. Um, so we will give you all of the background you need for the industry. Um, any questions that you might have throughout the interview, you should please feel free to ask your case interviewers. Um, we're not looking for overuse of economic jargon. I think like sometimes you see people who start throwing around big words and often they get it wrong, which is not what we like to see. Uh, if you use economic concepts, please make sure you're using them right. But really, a lot of what we do is sort of like common sense type work. Before you move on, one thing yeah. I'll say is um, you don't even need to have had much economics or any to, to do this type of work. It's just a helpful signal. So we've hired from Wellesley uh, people with chemistry degrees, people with physics degrees, others who are just, they like data. A lot of our work's about data. So you don't have to have econ or you don't have to have much econ. So don't let that distract you if, or worry you. And it will not keep you from doing well in the case. Thank you, Brian. That's really helpful. People, yeah, people are from all sorts of backgrounds. I, a guy who's a history maker did super, super well at All right, so I've said some of these already, but I'll focus in particular on the second one. Uh, the interviewer is trying to help you. It's not like a battle. It's really, if you guys are sort of stuttering or having trouble on something, we really want to help you through. I think it is more fun to give a case interview that goes well, and so we, we want to help you along. So you should listen to cues. So in particular, well, Brian, do you want to talk about your particular pet peeve? Yeah, um, it's not really a pet peeve, but one thing I've noticed, I sit on the undergrad recruiting team, so I hear all the feedback from the interviewers about the interviewees, and something that comes up all the time is, I couldn't get them to ever answer the second question. So I always sit, we'll go through some examples, but people say, what's the answer to this? And somebody will say, oh, here's an answer. And then I'll say, anything else? And they'll say, no. <laughs> and that's, Anything else is a hint, like, oh, hey, that's a fine answer, but think through some more answers and give those as well. And you don't have to do that every time because they're going to keep saying anything else, anything else. Uh, but try to do more than one uh, for any of these thought processes. Or if they say something like, are you sure about mm -hmm. that one? Or like, do you want to check your answer? You probably should. So that's just like take verbal cues. <laughs> Um, another one is making sure your assumptions are sensible and supportable. Something we should add here is if you're making an assumption, you should try to make that explicit. We always like to see that people are understanding what assumptions they're making. And then finally, recognize the results that don't make sense. So if something doesn't seem like it should be on the order of millions and it comes out on the order of millions, I, I think it's helpful for us if you recognize that yourself. Um, and so just you want to contextualize your results in the case that you're working on, and if it doesn't seem to make sense, Note that, that's a signal. All right, we're going to go through the sample merger case. Again, this is meant to be interactive, so I'll ask you folks some questions. All right, so this is the sample case. The uh, usual case is like 30 to 40 minutes, and there's these three different sections. Um, and this is the work. The merger, I work in a lot of mergers. Um, we do this now in our antitrust practice. All right. So. We have been hired by the FTC to investigate the impact of a potential merger between Ben and & Jerry's and Hong Dazs. Ben & Jerry's and Hong Dazs both sell ice cream in their ice cream stores and packaged ice cream in the supermarkets. In this case interview, the calculations will be limited to the ice cream store product market in a particular geographic region. All right, so first section is brainstorming. From the consumer's perspective, do you think a merger can be beneficial, harmful, or both? Yeah, um, it definitely could be both because in one, uh, from one perspective you can think that I have a lot more flavor so there will be a broader set of uh, products that is going to be offered to me now because they have slightly differentiated products. Um, another thing could be that when uh, these are both quite, uh, they have significant portions of mar uh, the market in um, ice cream industry. Uh, so if both of them come together, they become a pretty strong and big firm, a big company. So in that case, you could think that it could um, act like a monopoly, especially if you're focusing on one geographical area, in which case they can throw the prices up. At the same time, though, you could also think that um, if they are together now, 
maybe they don't have to spend as much time differentiating their product from each other so they don't have to spend as much time uh, as much money on advertising and those sort of things so that will also bring the cost down so we can argue that it might actually be cheaper to buy their ice cream Makes sense. any other thoughts yeah. from the customer perspective it affects the brand so people who love ben and jerry's are people who are interested in ben and jerry's and their brand and their vermont factory versus people who buy Hagen Dazs might have different values of what they're purchasing from their ice cream. So they're both big ice cream manufacturers, but they still have different brands and different types of customers who go to them. Yeah, so in this particular example, they're going to keep the two, they're going to operate the two businesses as separate businesses, but that's a really good point. Any other ideas? All right. So I think I would, you guys have touched on some of these things in particular. We talk a lot in mergers about efficiencies, so we talk about like, returns to scale. I think we've talked about that a lot in Econ and Wellesley. Um, but basically when two companies merge together, often they can bring costs down. Um, on the other side, there's decreases in competition and other possible harmful effects. All right. So tips for brainstorming. Um, you want to, if there's anything you're unclear about in the question, you want to ask again. Uh, often we'll read like a long page of information and you want to get a lot of that down, but any of that information that you might have missed, you can ask about later in the case interview. That's totally fine. So make sure you understand the question and that you have all of the information you need. Um, and then also, if we're saying something like beneficial, harmful, or both, that's a signal to you, as we talked about earlier, that we are looking for answers on both sides. All right, so we're entering now the quantitative portion, which will include uh, calculations. We've been asked to consider which consumers in a specific area may be harmed by a post-merger price increase. The table below provides details of the pre-merger market. So you can see we have the ice cream shop. This includes uh, Jerry's, the two merging firms, and then also other ice cream shops. Price per scoop and number of customers. So given the current conditions, what is the daily revenue the merged firm can expect? So I just want to stop for one second. So Kelly told you at the start that like we're not looking for human computers. The math is not actually all that hard. This is a little simpler than the math we use, <laughs> but it's not a lot simpler. And again, this is going to seem, I think, much. It's going to seem very easy in this setting, and it gets a little more stressful in the interview setting. Um, but again, we're not trying to trip you up with the math. So just because it sounds easy, talk it out, make sure you got it. But it probably is. Did you have a question? Oh, I was going to say, do you throw in tricky numbers to? Okay. I don't think so. Again, we're. We're not trying to trick you. We're trying to get a sense for how comfortable you are with numbers. But it's possible that the numbers are with a lot of zeros. Yes, it is possible that there's a lot of zeros. And also sometimes there'll be something that might be easier if you pick up like a tiny math trick, like something you would have learned in high school. But you know, it's not, as Brian said, super, super complicated. This is actually really not that difficult than that we do, but there's more steps. So what would happen to the market share of the merged firm if the merged firm raised the price of Ben & Jerry's? This is more of a conceptual question. It's also depend on the elasticity of the product, right? So whether or not consumers are willing to um, continue to buy the product if the price increases. So it would, it would go towards the price elasticity of, of ice cream and probably specific flavors in general as well. Mm -hmm. I think the demand for ice cream is pretty elastic, uh, so we could expect that if the price is going up, it's a normal good. So one would say that the general rule of thumb that it is going to, the uh, demand is going to go slightly low. Okay. So this is the sort of answer that we're looking for. I think both of you touched on this a lot. Um, in particular, we are assuming that uh, the Ben and Jerry's people, some of these people, if the uh, merged firm raises the price, some of these people will switch to lower prices. And um, in particular, some of the people switch to 
uh, Hagen Dolls, which is going to be one of the merged, which is now owned by the merged firm, then that is not going to be lost market for the merged firm. All right, so we're going to now consider the scenario where the merged firm raises the price of Ben and Jerry's to five dollars per scoop. We will assume that the customer is willing to pay four dollars for Ben and Jerry's prefer a higher quality ice cream. Thus, all of the customers leaving Ben and Jerry's, the variable X, now purchase ice cream from Hagen Dolls. How many customers could Ben and Jerry's lose? If the, for the merged firm's revenue to remain greater than or equal to the baseline revenue, which we calculated earlier. Okay. Any thoughts on how to set up the solution? Well, on one side we would have like our previous revenue, and then on the other side we'd want to set up basically what we had before built with these new numbers, and then just try to find X. In this case, is what I'm thinking, but I'm gonna pull out my like, some paper. Actually, let me see. You're exactly okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and this is again an example of I think this is like a pretty straightforward question that sounds complicated, and it's actually pretty straightforward. So yeah, that's correct. You would just set up exactly as you said. So this is exactly what the sort of thing would look like and there perhaps be more steps than the same concept. Finally, there is a conceptual discussion. So in this case, under the last pricing scenario we considered, the raised prices for Ben and Jerry's, which customers are harmed by this merger? The ones who are only willing to pay up to four dollars. So uh, the ones who are not willing to go beyond four dollars. The understand the ones who are more sensitive to a change in price. There are others who will be willing to pay a higher price. So the two hundred customers that we saw that got lost. Fair enough. Any other thoughts? So I think in that case, those customers could possibly switch to lower priced ice cream right? because there's not only the Ben and Jerry's that was charging $4 previously in the market, there's also other competitors that are charging lower prices, right? So if they raise the price above those $4, what would happen to those consumers? Oh, then just switch over to the others. Mm -hmm. So would they be harmed in that scenario? I mean, if they really were attached to the previous brand, they like they won't feel as satisfied by eating the other brand of the ice cream, but they could, in principle, just eat a different type of ice cream. Yeah, that's very fair. Or you could argue that all the consumers who are now paying five dollars for exactly the same product are also being harmed. I would say that. Yeah. And I also guess those who like Ben and Jerry's but do not like Hagen Dazs, but they still like high quality ice cream. So they wouldn't switch to Hagen Dazs, they would stay with Ben and Jerry's, but they're paying more as Casey said. Yeah, yeah. Alright. So I think we touched on each of these different things. So <clears throat> this is Brian's point from earlier that not only to focus on the first question or the first answer, which I think is that uh, you know that people are now paying more for the same item, but also people who are perhaps switch but didn't necessarily want to switch and wouldn't have another, another world. All right, so final thoughts on the case interview. Um, the case interviews that we do are both for us and for you. So the idea is that uh, it helps us assess your analytical skills and what you're good at and whether you can handle the types of work that we do and whether you find it interesting. Uh, it also gives you a chance to assess the work that we do. So. When we design the case interviews, we actually design them often based on the work that we actually do. So I remember when I was interviewing at Bates White, I thought the cases were actually like quite fun. I, I don't know, it was just like sort of interesting to think about these economic concepts. And again, they get quite a bit more complicated than these ones. So you can imagine that sometimes um, you're thinking about things that you don't get to think about in econ class, but it's, I think, more interesting. So uh, as I said, this case is representative of work that we work with, that work that we do at Bates White. Uh, in a real case of Bates White, you would be working with market data, so you might actually get like real numbers on 
how many people are sharing or getting ice cream rather than the thousand or so um, numbers that we had and also real data on prices. And of course, that's, I don't know, I think that's loads of fun. Um, uh, we would also often do like a merger retrospective. So we'd see what's happened to consumers uh, when similar firms have merged in the past. So I'm currently working on an insurance merger and so we're looking at, at in a market with similar uh, characteristics, what happens when firms merge and whether consumers are harmed. Interesting. Um, finally, we get to work with professors and sometimes, you know, the professor will have interesting ideas and then we get to develop the execution. And we tie it together into these expert reports that get submitted to the uh, juries, or rather to a judge and then share the trial. Any thoughts, Brian? Yeah, I have some different final thoughts. Um, so we did a very simple case study as we talked about. There's no way to get good at those without practicing. And I don't know how to do that other than like go to these sessions or do things with your friends and try to find old ones, talk to alumni um, who will be willing to give you old cases. So my personal recommendation to you is do this. Uh, the other schools we go to have consulting clubs. I think you have one here. Um, take advantage of the resources they have. Uh, do lots because there's again there's no way to practice other than just to do it going to more econ classes won't make you better at this going to regular behavioral interviews won't make you better at this yeah i think the biggest thing about these interviews at least in my experience is that a lot of it is just really common sense uh, i think it doesn't require like a lot of background knowledge about the industry it doesn't require a lot of background econ knowledge it's really just like you as a consumer actually have a lot more experience in these things that you maybe think you do. So a lot of it is just straight common sense and then often it's good to brush up on your like, basic arithmetic. Cool. Do you folks have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So are you like typically allowed to bring a piece of paper and a calculator for these? So you don't bring a calculator. We don't allow calculators. Yeah. Uh, we want to see how you can handle just like basic calculations. But uh, we do give you a piece of paper and an important thing that actually thank you for asking because we haven't mentioned yet, taking notes is super important. Um, and we actually do notice when candidates take organized notes and thoughtful notes. Um, so yes, you are allowed to have a piece of paper and use it. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the firm. So given the location of being in Washington, D.C., does it affect what kind of clients you take on? Do you work a lot more with like governmental agencies? Mm, no, with one sort of caveat. So. Um, just because we're in DC, we, we can do VTCs and fly out and meet people if we need to anywhere, but uh, the, it doesn't really affect it. We do a lot of work for the government, but so do all of our competitors, including the competitors who are in Boston. Um, so we're not hampered by that. So the one asterisk is um, we don't have a big finance practice. We sort of have a niche finance practice. Um, if you want to do a lot of finance, generally those practice areas are focused in New York for obvious reasons. Not exclusively, but generally. We do work a lot with agencies, though. So I do work in mergers in particular with DOJ and with FTC. So we do work with the government quite a bit. Sometimes for some things against. I'm just curious to hear about uh, your work. You said there's a lot of back and forth. Of course, you're going to review the whole process that other uh, this, uh, your opponents went through, and then they are going to review your work. So how yep. often could or how long could this back and forth go for? So that's set by the court. Okay. So the very the most typical is um, the plaintiffs go first because the burden of proof is on them. <laughs> so um, depending on the case, sometimes you start the case and your report's due in six weeks. Mm -hmm. I started a case and not submitted a report for six years. It just sort of depends on how the litigation goes. But then very typically after that, it's anywhere from six weeks to three months for the defendants to respond. Okay. And then the plaintiffs usually, but not always, get the last word. And they get somewhere between three weeks and three months. Just about something you mentioned, are the experts you work with all partners at a firm or no? No. Do you hire them? So uh, I would say we have three types of people that we support in the expert role. We have full-time consultants, so partners in the firm who are in the office every day. All the, yeah, all the founders are like that. Uh, we have partners who are uh, at outside institutions. So I was telling you about the Stanford professor and the like. 
so he's a partner in our firm. He's he's part of the firm, but we support him from afar. And then depending on uh, a variety of reasons, if we need uh, an expert with a different specialty, or somebody wants a specific expert, but that expert uh, doesn't have enough staff or whatever to support them, we will support outside experts as well. I would say the dominant form is the first one, which is like full-time consultant experts. Uh, my work's a little different, and it tends to be primarily with those outside uh, institution, but still partner experts. Uh, could you please speak towards the recruitment timeline for like for the full-time positions? Uh, for full-time, we're done recruiting this year. Um, but the way our recruiting process works, and um, maybe I'll take that as a prompt to talk about our internship program at the same time. So our typical uh, process is we have a summer consultant program, which is for rising seniors, so people after their junior year. We'll start recruiting them, I want to say in early September, almost as soon as you're back at schools when we start. And then normally we're on campus uh, sometime in late September, early October uh, for an info session or something, and a couple weeks later the application deadline happens, and then we go forward. So, that's how we get our summer consultants, and we typically hire anywhere from 20 to 25 of them. And then if everything goes well, they all get offers at the end of the summer. And if things go really well, they all accept it, and we don't have to go do any senior recruiting. It doesn't usually happen that way, but that would be ideal. And so we do the senior recruiting at the same time as we do that internship recruiting. Um, so we used to do both fall and spring recruiting. And what we found, is, and generally it was we did the senior, uh, trying to hire seniors in the fall and juniors in the spring, and just all of that has shifted to the fall. So I'm going to take a second to talk about our summer internship program. Or we call it our summer consultant program because you don't do typical interny, go get coffee kind of things. Uh, so it's a 10-week paid internship. Um, you come to D.C., work with us. You go through all the same training that we put our full-time staff through, which is a lot. It's your first two weeks is basically all training of the 10, and then you're on a case team. And we treat you just like a, a new consultant. So you get the same type of assignments, you're part of the team, you go to the expert calls, you do consult work, and you figure out, do you want to do this as a career? And not everybody does. There's a lot of coding, which I think surprises some people. Generally, the ones who don't come to info sessions. Uh, but a big part of our job is doing data processing and analysis. Simple stuff in Excel, more complicated things in Stata, R, SQL, SAS, those kind of programs. So anyway, we put people through all that. And then we also make you do uh, a fundraiser as a team building exercise, which is my favorite part of the whole year. The last three years, we've had balloon wars, which was started as an idea from the summer consultant program. but. You can pay money and they'll fill people's offices with balloons. So I don't know if anybody caught it, but many slides ago, um, the board basically spent $2,000 and filled one of the equity partners' offices with balloons up to about here. And then he thought that was great, and he made everybody come there and have the meetings, yeah. which was fun, but it smelled terrible. <laughs> but anyway, the summer consultants do f things like that as team building. And then they do a lot of social activities. Um, also, it's team building, but also we design it to, we design each of the activities to expose you to a different part of the firm. So there's, um, you come in, you get a, what we call a sponsor and a peer coach. So the sponsor is what most people would think of as their manager. It's the person who's collecting and delivering their feedback. You get a peer coach who's basically a social role, uh, introducing you to the firm, getting you familiar with people, but also there to help you with your coding if you need it or how to do research, those kind of things. Um, so we do a couple of events with them. We do a event with the managers and principals. We do a separate event with the partners. We do a sailing trip. Um, we do all kinds of things. So it's a very social uh, program. And going back to everybody talks about their vault rankings, we've been ranked number one in the whole country at least once or twice, uh, both for consulting but also among all internships. And, so there's at least some outside uh, validation that it's a good program. I wasn't a summer consultant, but I was a, I've been a peer coach for summer consultants for every summer that I've been a Bates wife. Or, yeah. And 
it's really fun. I think the program's really good. I work with summer consultants um, when they come and work on my projects, and they do the same work we do, as Brian said. I think some summer consultants, when they return to the firm for full-time work, will work on the exact same project they worked on as a summer consultant, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and it's also, I mean, it's a great experience, both like for your career and also I, I think it's really fun. Any other questions? All right, awkward silence. <laughs> um, so we'll be up here if anybody wants to talk, but thanks for coming. And I hope to see you all next year.